<laughs> okay, welcome You're to Getting to Know to Jesus. We are in kid. Lesson 30. <laughs> the, this is on Lesson pages 45 to 54 in your book. The Bible text is on pages 46 and 47. And the Lesson Notes page uh, starts on page 48 and goes through page 52. So if you want to take notes on the lesson as we're going through there, you can do that. We're going to talk about how to handle critics. Jesus discusses fasting. <laughs> so, yes. How to ha Does anybody have any critics that you'd like oh, to handle? Oh, last well, couple of years we've had our uh, lion's share. Man. You've had a few, haven't you? Everybody And uh, I just unfriended a couple of them on Facebook not too long ago, too. Our so. dear friend, the lady that was the nipper. Uh, well, she unfriended me, so that's... So she did your favor. I took care of the other one. She did your big favor. So, have you ever known... Oh, here's a little map. Uh, this, if you can, this is just the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And so here's Capernaum. This event takes place in Capernaum. And we have the other side. The five feet of the 5,000 took place over here somewhere in this shore. Um, Magdala was down here a little further. And way down south of that was Tiberius, uh, not Tiberius, uh, yeah, Tiberius? Tiberius. Tiberius, yeah. Okay, so that will help you get a little perspective there. That is actually a satellite photograph of the Holy Land. And I took my camera and took a picture of it. Or, or did I scan that one with my scanner? I don't remember. But uh, it's Capernaum, the city of Nahum the prophet. It, it came out very grainy, so I'm looking for better graphics. Hey, here's a picture That's of Bergenvillia oh, so in Capernaum. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The oh, pavilion that you it's see, so beautiful. the roof that you see right behind there is the roof over what's supposed to be the remains of Peter's house. And there's a Byzantine church built on top of Peter's house. That's how come they figured it's Peter's house. You don't build a church over nothing. They build yeah. a church over it. Okay. Can we see them? I'm going to show them on this clan. It's church, which is built over the ruins of Peter's I don't worry about that. They can buy the books. The picture's in the book. So, well, we're going to talk about how to handle critics. Have you ever noticed that no matter what you do, someone is going to criticize it? Yeah. That's I've already right. run into, uh, back in California, I went to talk to a minister about doing getting to know Jesus at his church or him doing it. He says, what Bible translation did you use? <laughs> oh my. Uh, let me guess. It had to be King James. K-J-B. Oh, yeah. oh, no. I said, I used the New International Version. Oh, no, that's not the authorized version. <laughs> well, that conversation didn't go very far. So. I'll say, and who authorized? And, uh, Can you give him a KJV uh, revision well, special? Well, KJV now, I did talk to a publisher yeah. who that didn't want to do the Zondervan. Uh, or the NIV, because Zondervan owns that, and they own the New King James Version. Yeah, and so they wanted me to do it in the New King James Version. So I started switching over and, and building up a, a New King James Version version. And they said, no, no, we're not interested. So, How far did you get into it? Days oh, about seven, months? eight lessons, ten lessons. Oh, wow. It's not too far mm -hmm. before they decided that. Weeks worth of work or more? Mm, a week's worth of work or more. Forty hours. 50 hours. Good, 40, 50 hours. Yeah, sweet. It's a lot better than doing 160 lessons and then getting rejected. But then, on the other hand, if they had accepted it, I'd had to get the rest of it done. I'd be published. But life goes on. But I, I told Sylvia, I told this uh, 15 years ago when we first started. No matter how we do this ministry, there are going to be people that didn't criticize it. No matter how we do Northside Christian Church, no matter how what denomination you belong to. Yeah. How big church, people criticize the big churches, people criticize the little churches, people criticize all the churches in between, <laughs> people criticize people that go on Jamaica mission trips, yeah. people criticize people that don't go on Jamaica mission trips. Yeah. There's going to be somebody that's going to think yeah, it's their job. Jamaica, you think you're going to a resort. Yeah. yeah. So, hang out at the beach. Especially Everybody will look back after the event. And of course, here's the, other, here's the other side of this coin. After the event, how many armchair quarterbacks could have told the quarterback, if yep. you'd have just done this, you wouldn't have got that? That's right. <laughs> After That's it's already happened. Yeah. Our hindsight, hindsight is 2020, 20, they say. Well, so uh, we'll look back after the event and criticize or complain. 
uh, some people who feel insecure or feel like they need a control or uh, something will criticize during the event. Hey, wait a minute, you're not doing it my way, it's my way or the highway. Uh, if, you, if you're not doing it my way, you're doing it the wrong way. Some people just don't intend to be pleased with anything you do. So we get all kinds of people out there and just understand that's part of life and you just have to kind of deal with it. Well, John's disciples come and inquire why Jesus and his disciples never participate in the fast like the Pharisees do. Oh, here we got some critics questioning why I'm doing what I'm doing. Now, Jesus replies, armchair quarterbacks are common and cheap. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14, Mark 2, verse 18, and Luke 5, 33. Mark said, begins this one. He says, now John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. Mm -hmm. And Matthew says it's John's disciples that came and asked Jesus, how is it that we and John's disciples and the Pharisees fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours are not. They go on eating and drinking. Oh, I thought somebody Armchair quarterback. She's got your coffee to sit up. She'll get it for you. Looks like a work. Matthew says that John's disciples questioned Jesus about working. fasting. John's disciples joined with some Pharisees to question Jesus about why he and his disciples don't fast. To them, fasting is a religious duty. And there were some situations under the Old Testament law where uh, they uh, strongly encouraged fasting. Morty, you look a mess. Okay. I'm, fasting. I'm criticizing you. No, that's, that's Chuck Daddy looks. Morty just got, but we started this. No, I said, no matter what you do, somebody's going to criticize. <laughs> See, that's what you get for coming late. Somebody's going to criticize it, and everybody on YouTube is going to be watching it. Oh gosh. So, fasting is literally doing without, and it's usually applied to food in the Old Testament, but. It can be applied to a behavior, or a non-food item, or even an activity as well. Uh, there have been several times when Sylvia and I participated in a 40-day fast before Easter. Usually it was we'd fast meats and sweets. Uh, one year, I fasted the speed limit. You did. I mean, I said, if the speed limit was 40, I set my cruise control on, on 40. Or I regulated my gas pedal, so I was on 40, not 41 or 45, <laughs> four zeros, what it said on my speedometer. And, and now it doesn't deep. matter how yeah. inaccurate my speedometer is. Have I have found since I've gotten my GPS that 40 means I'm only going 37 and a half. <laughs> but I don't fudge that two and a half miles because there might be some that might not agree with me on that. Yeah. But anyhow, for 40 days, it was a one zone that was a 30 mile zone. And everybody liked to run through there 40, 45, 50. And one guy was honking at me to get out of my way. Yeah. And I was within the, I was right on the speed. I wasn't going 25 or 20. I wasn't like uh, some people that just don't know how fast to go. They're, they're supposed to go a little faster. They're impeding the flow. But uh, you couldn't wait the, there, the bottom go. line to that is that there are many ways of fasting. It's not so much what you fast as it is why you fast. We'll talk about that a little more here in a bit. Now, fasting is usually accompanied with mourning over a loss or beseeching God for a need or searching God to seek His guidance. If you're not accompanying a fast with prayer and, and time with God, then you're just going on a diet. So, there was only one fast that was actually required in the Old Testament and that was on the Day of Atonement, and it only lasted for one day. Now, I know you'll read through there, and you'll find at various times, so-and-so fasted for 40 days. But that was not a required fast under the law. This was just, uh, they were burdened, and that's how long it took them. We know Jesus fasted for 40 days. Uh, I'd be afraid to go that long without food. I would probably lose some weight. I'd shrivel up and die, or something like that. Well... Only for three weeks One important ingredient to the fast is devotion and petition to God over some particular issue. So again, if you're not if you're not fasting for a reason, a spiritual reason, then you're just going on a diet. 
if it's pertaining to food. Fasting without prayer and focus on God is a diet. Sometimes we think we are more spiritual than others when we do some sort of religious behavior. Oh, I'm fasting. That makes me more spiritual than you. Um, I don't see that in the Bible, but sometimes, well, what we do, uh, Jesus talks about the one Pharisee that went in, hey, God, look how great I am, and mm -hmm. then the publican, he goes over there in the corner and says, oh, God, have mercy on me. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there are some who want to think it's cool to brag about their religiosity. Then we start to judge our brothers in Christ because they aren't doing what we're doing. Now, have you ever been guilty of judging another church or another brother in Christ or another denomination because they aren't doing what we're doing? Yeah, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, our acts of worship are not to show off in front of others, but are a personal thing between God and ourselves. So, do you have any traditions or rituals that you have required as a part of your religious behavior. Oh, we've got to do this or we are not right. And the cause of this doesn't mean that the habit itself is necessarily bad. It means that we need to examine why we have communion every Sunday, why we have this order of worship, or why we sing these songs, or why we have that kind of a sermon, or whatever other things we may do even during the week. Can I ask a question? You may ask a question. Well, like, how did they start with Easter sunrise service? When I was a Catholic, they never. Yeah, I think now the Catholics are into it. Yeah. I don't that, know is, where is that, that started, but uh, the reason for it is because Jesus rose early in the morning. Yeah, By the time the ladies were there, shortly after sun come up, the tomb was already empty. Right. And so that's the main reason why churches that do that, or people that sunrise do that, service. celebrate the sunrise service. We're going to have some Easter sunrise service in future events. We, uh, you know, we were talking about that just today. We'd like to go to one. We wanted to go to a church that has an Easter sunrise service that serves breakfast. Oh, yeah. I did. Calvary Baptist. So, Cassandra, guess what's on your plate for next year? If we get that kitchen finished, we can do that. But that's something that we can look at in the future. There's a place out in Colorado, the Garden of Gods, where they have three, Lake Wales? three uh, crosses there. Uh -huh. And they hold Easter sunrise services there. We had quite a time, and we went out to the Garden of the Gods and threw our sleeping bags on the ground and sleep. Well, when we woke up, there was a whole crowd of people because they're having sunrise service. Oh, my. Here we go. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, 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 that's why am I calling? Well, we're going to go on here. Another way of another <coughs> point in handling critics is to put the critics in perspective. Matthew chapter nine verses fifteen and sixteen, Mark two verses nineteen and twenty one, Luke five thirty four through thirty six. Jesus answered, "How can the guest of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot love. They cannot as long as they have him with them." The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. He told them this parable. No one sews a patch on an untrunk cloth of an old garment, from a new garment, onto, and sews it on an old garment. If he does, a new piece will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse, and the patch from the new will not match the old. Well, you've got to put your critics in perspective. Jesus replies, by making an allegory of his ministry to a wedding party. No one fasts at a wedding party. Well, not unless it's the jilted ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend. <laughs> they might fast, but then they probably won't be there at the wedding party to begin with. <clears throat> Most people go to a wedding, have a tendency to celebrate. They oh, want to yeah. be happy for the couple that got married. Uh, maybe some people just want to be happy for all that food they're getting to eat and they don't have to pay for it. I uh, hope not. Jewish weddings usually last a week and are full of food, right. fun, and frivolity. This is definitely not a time to fast and mourn. Happy people rejoice. Sad people fast. So, do you mourn your relationship with God or do you celebrate? Do you fast 
Oh dear, I'm a Christian. <clears throat> or do you say, praise God, I'm a Christian, pass the biscuits and gravy. Or whatever is on the table for that meal. Jesus fasted at the beginning of his ministry to get in tune with God. Seek his will and commit to following his purpose. He fasted when proscribed by Mosaical Law, the Day of Atonement, that one day. He would have fasted that. There's no evidence of Jesus fasting at any other time. That doesn't mean that he didn't. That simply means that there's no evidence of him fasting any other time. His presence was a time of celebration, not a time of mourning. So, hey, that's, maybe that's why we like to celebrate worship on Sunday mornings. I know some churches like to mourn on Sunday mornings. They, oh me, I'm a sinner. But other churches, I think most people like to celebrate. Uh, George? You say he fasted on the Day of Atonement. What is the Day of Atonement? Well, I mean, think about uh, what it means because he was. Yeah, it means to he be. He was what he was doing. He was the Atonement. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's what it just dawned on me. Yeah. Good observation there. Thank you for pointing that out. But by the time that, that the Atonement, he was practicing this and he was the Atonement, it wasn't even called the Day of Atonement. It was called the the fast. That's all it was called. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that, that the atonement had sense. kind of disappeared from the vocabulary. How much they had slipped away yeah. from following the law yeah. of God? <gasps> Doesn't sound like any churches today, does it? <laughs> oh, no. Well, let's go on. Now, no. another thing in handling your critics is you need to be able to support your decision. Matthew nine seventeen. Mark 2, 22, Luke 5, verses 37 through 39. Here's what Jesus says. Neither do men, no one, pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, a new wine skin will, the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will run out. Both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine, the pour the new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And both are preserved. And by the way, just a little side note here. No one, after drinking the old wine, wants the new. He says the old is better. We talked about uh, good wine when Jesus did the wedding mm -hmm. feast. Well, you uh, want to be able to support your decision. Yes, George? There's always been this discussion as when they say wine, that was that alcoholic wine, or was that just sure? Uh, sure, but I don't see yeah. any reason why it would not have been. Right. Uh, because it would have fermented, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have been a fermented wine. So yeah. couldn't have been Although there was a wine that was not fermented. Yeah. Yeah. Richard? Okay, uh, the word cider is probably the best translation for the Greek word oinos. Oinos means squeeze really? it out. Mm -hmm. Whether it's hard cider or sweet cider, the Greek doesn't tell you if, uh, one, one or the other. No. Uh -huh. right. Now, in the setting, uh, if it was an alcoholic <laughs> wine and barrels of Jesus created, it would have been the biggest beer bash this side of Galilee. Everybody okay. had been staggering out of that party, snockered. I'm sure they uh, were. Others will, will say that <laughs> so was fruit juice, and that's yeah. the most uh, uh, expensive way to host with expensive fruit juice. And so the teetotalers will argue it's fruit, fruit juice, yeah. the Lutherans will argue yeah. it was fooch. Yeah. Yeah. And it uh, depends on if you're Lutheran or whether you, you're Methodist and you took the pledge. <laughs> it does come from your perspective. Yeah, you know, we, we can take a little sidebar and just say, well, the bottom line is don't get drunk. But the, the other side is, yeah, if you have a problem with alcohol, then uh, don't start. And uh, you got to remember, this was not a religious festivity they were having. This no. Was a wedding was taking place, yes. yes, and right. I'm sure that they had a bash. Yeah. It, it would <laughs> seem more yeah. logical. Yeah. Anyhow, we're going on here. We need to be able to support our decision. Jesus also illustrates fasting from the perspective of patching a tear in a garment something that most no longer know how to do. In Jesus' day, fabrics were not pre-shrunk. Garments would shrink when washed, and holes in garments were also patched instead of just thrown in, throwing the garment away and going out and buying a new one. What do we do today? We got a hole in my sock? I throw the whole sock away. Put it in the rag bag. I remember when my wife, mother would mm -hmm. darn my sock. And your wife. We got a second wedding. And your mother and your wife. I wouldn't have any socks if I did that. I had darned his socks too. Holy socks. Uh, really spiritual, yeah. huh? Well, they're so good. Hey. Sometimes I can still pull. I used to have these darning <laughs> eggs. You know, they're uh, egg made. Mom used a light bulb. 
I did too the other day. Yeah, okay, well that works. <laughs> it yeah. works, sure so does. Some people still dart. Works even better than yeah. darting. And they're not using it as an Make sure that's not a curse word or something. And they're not Darn. using it as a curse word, that's right. Well, <laughs> Jesus illustrates the patch there. If you patch a new cloth onto an old garment, the new patch, having not been pre-shrunk, they didn't have these pre-shrunk fabrics that we have today, it would shrink, it would pull away from the old patch, and you've got a bigger hole now than what you had to start with. And now I guess we'll okay. try they would love it. patching it again. Yeah, some people think it's cool to run around garments with holes in them in right. places where they yeah. should not be they, holes. They, they, they buy blue jeans. Yeah. 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 I've got a pair of boots, but I need to be selling them for retail. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sure. I think I threw them away, didn't I? I told you to. There was nothing left to yeah, but somebody had paid good money for that. Yeah. Well, so, uh, <laughs> the Old Testament. There are some people who would pay them. Yeah. They'd give you $5 for them if you put a good pair of jeans out there. They don't look at them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it could, so the, the Old Testament is like a well-worn garment. It has been worn, it has been shrunk, it's got the holes in it and everything and all that sort of thing. Jesus did not come to patch the problems in the Old Testament. God designed the Old Testament. Some people, I've heard some people say that God made a mistake when He made the Old Testament. So He covered up His mistake by sending Jesus and coming out with the New Testament. No, God did not make a mistake. God designed the Old Testament to help us realize that we were sinners in need of a Savior. There was not a one of those 613 laws that man was not capable of keeping. The old bring us to the new. He designed the old to bring us to the new. Yep. And the point that Jesus is making right here is the old is a new, a well-worn garment, and the new covenant, Jesus didn't come to patch the garment problems in the old, but to replace it with a new covenant that is far superior. If you go through the Old Testament, show me in the Old Testament where there was a provision for the forgiveness of sin. Now, you could roll the penalty of sin back another year, but the penalty still was there until Jesus died on the cross paying the penalty. I would disagree with you because of the fact that if you could live the law, you could, have, you could be forgiven. You could live in right standing with God Almighty. The only problem is nobody could. Nobody, nobody chose. They could. They didn't choose well, to do so. See? We, we the only one that ever did it was Christ. Yeah. We try so many times, we try to say, well, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. The devil didn't make you do anything. <laughs> you chose to do it. And, and Jesus was tempted by the same devil. Yeah. He was just as human as we are, but he did not mm -hmm. sin. Yeah. And if Jesus can say no to the devil, and we love Jesus, and we are focused on Jesus, we can learn to recognize temptation and say no to The only problem is that sometimes... We get a little tired, we get a little cranky, and we get a lot selfish, and we don't. Shame on me. And I'm constantly examining myself. I hope you are examining yourself. Make sure your motives are right. But in the Old Testament, there was no uh, forgiveness. They only rolled the penalty back year for year. The Old Testament was also a religion of works. Keep the 613 laws, you're a good person. Break one of those laws, you're dirt. And, of course, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether we broke the Old Testament laws or one of the two New Testament commandments. You know, love God, love people. Ever been time when you've done something that wasn't loving to people? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Okay. The New Testament is covered by mercy and grace. Jesus came to... Uh, uh, replace the Old Testament with the New. Now, righteousness is based on our faith, heart, faith, and obedience to God, not on our religious actions. So it doesn't matter how good you are, it's your heart towards God. You may be still struggling with some sin area in your life. I'm fighting it, God, but I haven't got a handle on it yet. You may be learning to recognize it, but you still haven't got a handle on it yet. But if you love God like David loved God, even when he had an affair with Bathsheba, and I don't want to justify going out and having an affair, you know better than that. 
you do that, you're going to pay for it. Abraham passed his wife off as a sister twice. A man is supposed to be a man, the, the pillar of faith. So yeah, God uses imperfect people. And I'm another one of them. But that doesn't justify. It only explains. There's a difference there. We can explain that we've fallen, but we cannot justify that we've fallen. And that's why we need Jesus. And if God sees it in your heart, you are truly trying to follow Jesus, He can overlook a few indiscretions. And you're not going to go to hell just because you lost your temper a minute ago and you're dying right now. It's not like, oh, I've got to go get repentance before I die. Uh, God knows the bigger picture. He allows you to forgive something like that. He allows you forgiveness. He allows us forgiveness. You quit teaching and go on to preach I hope so. <laughs> Sometimes we need to think about these things. We, we're constantly examining ourselves. You don't have to examine anybody else. Because no matter who you examine, you're going to find fault with them. If you want to find fault with them, you're going to find good with them. If you want to find good with them. But what about you? We'll talk about that sometime in the near future too. Jesus repeats the point using the illustration of wineskins. In Jesus' day, wine was stored in animal skins and made especially for that purpose. Leg openings were stitched shut and sealed, and the neck was used to pour in the wine. The new wine skins were supple. They would stretch as the wine ferments. The old wine skins had become brittle and would not expand. If you put new wine, skin in, wine into an old wine skin, it wants to stretch and expand. The old wine skin says, I can't handle this. And it splits wide open, and you've ruined the wine skin and the Lost wine. Lost the product, yeah. So, uh, and I would presume, and I don't know the grape juice, unfermented expands. So that would have to refer to an alcoholic beverage for those who want to make a technicality over thank that God little for issue. Glass. Well, they what? Also, thank God for glass. <laughs> thank God for glass. <laughs> they also have a problem. Don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Now, we, we've water. improved our, our yeah. wine containers, I guess. Yeah, we've got bad water, yeah. right? That's yeah. how well, when they boiled the, the, uh, the <laughs> grapes down to what they called the prudum, <laughs> and it was a situation where it was a grape concentrate like raisin, and they put water in there and, and boil. That's it out of the sun. And, it, and it would re, it's reconstituted yeah. grape juice, but it was like Kool Aid, it was kind of like concentrate. <laughs> Yeah, and they drink uh, much more wine percentage-wise than this country does because of the fact that the water was a problem. Water was a problem? Wine problem. Oh, yeah. was a little more... Uh, well, I don't know. The wells there in Galilee yeah. seem to be sweet water. Yeah. yeah. Well, still had a problem. we're going to water. go on here. The, the, again, the back to the bottom line, Jesus is providing a new covenant that will work, that will not work with the old covenant. Each had its purpose, but they are not intercompatible. I didn't mention, I think I've mentioned this previously. In the Old Testament, the promises were health, wealth, and long life. You keep the, the 613 laws, you're going to be healthy, you're going to be wealthy, and you're going to live a long time. In the New Testament, the promises are you'll be forgiven of your sins and you'll have eternal life. Now, would you rather live a long life and still die and go to hell, or would you have a, rather have eternal life and, and be poor on this earth while you're waiting to get there? Live long and go to hell. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you had to choose, I could give up a lot of wealth a lot quicker than I could give up eternal life. Amen. Although sometimes I have to remind myself of that. And I'm a sure you do too. Nice. <laughs> they are not intercompatible. The old pointed out the final the old pointed out that we have a sin problem. The new provides the only workable and final solution to that <coughs> problem. And the reason it is the only workable solution is because God made it. And God being God, the supreme being, has the right, the authority, the power to say all that you have to do to inherit the new promise, the new covenant, eternal life, is what I tell you you have to do. And what's he tell us we have to do? Believe that Jesus is a Christ, repent of our sins, confess Him as our Lord and Savior, be immersed in His name as an act of obedience, show Him that we've done these things, and act like a Christian. I mean, if you're going to go back to the ways of the world, then why are you wearing the name Christian? Why are you bothering to go through the process if you're going to continue doing what you were doing? Now I'm preaching again. 
But I think that's something we sometimes need to preach a bit. We often get used to the old, so used to the old, that we sometimes have difficulty recognizing that the new is better. And some, we, we find that challenge with some of the things that happen in the church today. Some people resist to the new technology. I remember uh, a church in, in Glendale, uh, uh, California. The pastor wanted to bring in the overhead projector and put the songs up there and use PowerPoint in his sermons and, and uh, get rid of the hymn books. <gasps> we can't get rid of the hymn books! That's a sacred tradition. Okay. And he wanted to change the stage around what about and modify the pews? things. Remember, yeah. we wanted to put cheer, chairs in. They wanted to put oh, yeah. the pews in. The associate pastor that. that came and worked with him for a while wanted to get rid of the pews and put chairs, oh, stadium gosh. seated chairs, oh. so we could set the sanctuary up for a sporting event or put tables in there if we wanted right. to do other things, you know, besides Sunday morning worship. And, and if you have chairs, you can get actually a higher seating capacity than if you have pews. But oh boy, oh. that only lasted so long and then one Sunday the chairs went out and the pews went back and that was the end of that one. And, uh, See, that's what makes it. A lot of people look at the church building and the, and the place yeah. as being the church. But it ain't. Where are the people, people of the church. Oh, the church you know, is where they meet. The that is correct. We've had people offer us pews a couple you times here something? in the last oh, month. Oh, is that right? Uh, they yeah, get okay. rid of the pews. They want to dump the pews on sure. And once you got a pew, you got to build your building around the pew. Oh, yeah. 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 Because ours has to be a multi-purpose. No so ours has got to be a multi-purpose. We, we're going to host 50 or 60 men for men's fellowship, 25, 35 women for ladies' fellowship. you got to have Try moving yeah. pews around to set up tables. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, a lot of work. It'll work, but it's a lot of work. And, of course, the pews are taking up space where you need to have tables and chairs. Well, let's go on here. Fasting is neither good nor bad. True believers will not be legalistic or confined to rituals. Now, if fasting means something to you, go for it. Like I said, come in with prayer and time with God. If uh, fasting isn't relevant to your life, don't force yourself or let anybody else force you into it. And this is just something that you decide, you know what, I, I choose to go along. The Old Testament had its place. <coughs> But it has been replaced by the New Testament. <coughs> the New Testament did not patch the Old Testament. The New Testament did not add to the Old Testament. And all, so in that perspective, the Ten Commandments are no longer binding on us. Especially the keeping the Sabbath day. We don't keep the Sabbath day. We remember the other commandments because they are encompassed in love God, love people. On uh, these two commands hinge all of the law and the prophets, Jesus said. And you know what I find out? I find out it's a lot more challenging to say, well, now, am I loving God here or am I loving man? Than it is to say, well, am I keeping this law, 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 this law. I, I tried to do it. I think one time I tried to say, well, okay, if they're the same, then the first four equals one, and the next six yeah. equal the other. Uh -huh. And that's what yeah. it works out for. Yeah. And, and it basically, basically, and, and of course, at this point in time, Jesus has not died on the cross, so they are still under the old covenant. But, but many gonna, of those things, many of those things found in the uh, Ten Commandments are natural to the human race. Yeah, they yeah. not yes, they are. Yeah. not steal. Those should be natural things applied to them. Yeah, the law. Uh, even, the law is based on it. And even I mean, though we don't keep the seventh day, we do keep. Right the Lord's today. Day. Lord's because that's the day that Jesus rose. That's the day the other church meet, met. Peter, started the first meeting. Day the Pentecost, first that's the start. day they would become in the habit of meeting. That's the day that... Uh, first one more. The resurrection. Uh, day that they got together to celebrate the Lord's Supper. So, yeah. And, and that's the day that John was caught up into heaven for the book of Revelation. Richard? Yeah, of the Ten Commandments, nine of the ten are restated in the New Testament and intensified. He yeah. says... You've heard of old, I shall not kill, but I said, don't hate. Uh, don't commit adultery, I said, don't even lust. And so he took the, the same concepts and brought them over. The only one that was lacking, of course, was the, the uh, remember, the Saturday as far as the, yeah. the, the day of uh, so, the day of rest. The day of rest, uh, he says, and then by example, the first day became the day the early mm -hmm. church met. Yeah. Okay. Well, oh, fasting cannot be used as a gauge of one's spirituality. 
Freedom in Christ has no part in the bondage of the Old Covenant. So, next week, Jesus is going to do some career training. Two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. For those of you that Next week, uh, Walter Milky is going to be with us doing 3rd John study here at the house. <coughs> next week, Jesus is schedule. going to do some career training, and he will teach us how to be waiters. And it'll be Anybody right want to get into right the waiting here. business? Sharon's got the key. He will She's also, the house. Jesus will also teach us how to be patient. Uh, okay, so it's time to break for our discussion questions. You can follow us and stay in touch with what is happening with the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry on Plaxo, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and watch our video clips on YouTube and GodTube. Getting to Know Jesus is sponsored by New Hope Gospel Ministries. If you'd like to follow along with us and start your Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study group, or just pray for us or support our ministry, you can go to www.gettingtoknowjesus.org and find all the information that we have available for you. If you look at the lower right-hand corner, there's a button where you can make a safe and secure donation to the Getting to Know Jesus Bible Study Ministry. Or you can go to the order page and order your Getting to Know Jesus books for your Bible study group. Thank you for stopping by and keep us in your prayers and let us know how we can pray for you.